to Jurassic Park. Hi everyone, welcome to The Broken Meeple, I'm Luke Hector, and on this review I will do my best, after that introduction, not to sing the Jurassic Park theme tune if possible. Because the game I'm reviewing is pretty much Jurassic Park the board game. Dinosaurs are a great theme. I love dinosaurs, I've loved dinosaur movies, there's just something about them, they're great, I like learning about them, probably the one bit of history that I actually have a genuine interest in. But, you know, board games with dinosaurs? hit and miss. There's not been a huge amount of them and, you know, they've never always been like massive hits. Although, does anybody remember a, what, a classic called Valley of the Dinosaurs from the 80s? I think it was a Hasbro, was it a Hasbro game or a Ravensburger one? It was a big green box and you had plastic T-Rexes and stuff. Who remembers that? That was a great game. Loved it. Wish I had it now. But this time, I'm looking at this heavy monstrosity that is Dinosaur Island by Pandasaurus Games. Doesn't look like a heavy monstrosity, but believe me, there's a lot of stuff in this box and it makes it pretty heavy. It could do with an insert, but, you know, we'll see whether somebody's going to get on that, uh, you know, wave at some point in the future, wink wink. But Dinosaur Island, as I said, Jurassic Park, the board game. You are building an amusement park with dinosaurs as your main attraction. You can make all kinds of dinosaurs from their genes and populate your park with them. The safer the dinosaur, like the herbivores, will generally be interesting, but will only get so many people in your park, will only get so many points, but at least they don't have a danger of eating people. You can then progress up the chain to omnivores and carnivores, and sorry, not omnivores, carnivores and giant carnivores, where they get you more people, they're more exciting, but then you need more security in order to get past the fact that these nasty dinosaurs might break out and start eating your patrons which for some reason doesn't deter them from coming back next year. I mean, seriously, it's just like the movies. You'd think they'd learn by now, but anyway, I digress. So with this one, it's a multi-worker placement game. And I say multi because you've got multiple phases and multiple different boards that you do with the worker placement. You have four main phases. The first one is a science phase. You roll these awesome dice. They look like those amber things that they get the mosquito out of and they've got custom faces on it. I mean, they are gorgeous dice. I almost touted as to whether I thought I preferred them to the ones in Seasons, which have been my all-time favourite dice to date. Don't think it quite makes the cut. I still think Seasons gets it just because they're boulders and you get to roll them so often, but this is probably a, a good second place. These dice you will roll, and they can get you different genetic, you know, DNA strands that you need to make the various dinosaurs, but you also put scientists out in order to get new dinosaur recipes and to basically upgrade your lab so you can have more DNA samples in stock. After that phase is done, you then progress to another work, sort of worker placement phase. It's more of a selection phase where you will draw tiles from a selection of different rooms and upgrades that you can get to your park. So you can get upgrades to your tool room, you can get upgrades to the park itself, you can buy the attractions like roller coasters and ice cream stalls. I mean, you know, I want to see a T-Rex as much as the next person, but hey, I want an ice cream too. And you can get personnel for your park, so they will give you special abilities, they'll give you more workers. Once you're done with that phase, you move on to another board, which is your own player board, where you have little meeple workers, and you will simultaneously place these on various spots in order to do various stuff, in order to get par, get more security, get you know, to do basically what most worker placements do, get stuff for your park. And then after that, you have a phase where people are drawn from a bag, you've got these yellow and purple meeples, yellow for the patrons and purple for hooligans, and you draw them and you place them in your park in order to get victory points or money depending on the attraction. 
Hooligans are annoying though, because they don't pay to get in. They're, they're nasty. You don't want them. You want to kick them out. Unfortunately, they sneak in, they get on the rides and don't pay a penny. Of course, if your security level is not high enough, which is dictated by the dinosaurs you have and the dice that isn't chosen from the uh, initial drafting phase, then the dinosaurs will eat occasional patrons, which obviously loses you some points. I mean, come on, what do you expect? I mean, to be fair, if having people get eaten and losing a point is the worst ramification for that, then seriously, I don't think you've got to worry about too much, really. This is definitely a fictional world this is happening in. You can make every joke possible about what would really happen if you tried this. I mean, hell, the movies have been pretty much doing that themselves. So you will go through this process, rinsing and repeat, until somebody has completed a certain number of objectives, at which point, finish the round, game ends, tally up, and of course, the winner is the one with the most victory points. Of course! Now the first thing you'll notice is this weird kind of, I like to call it 80s retro style that they've used. It's very psychedelic, it's all sort of like muted pinks and pale colours and turquoises and stuff like that. It kind of gave me the same vibe I got from the 4 Ragnarok trailer when they did that, because they made that really sort of 80s vibe, didn't they? And to be fair, it was one of the best trailers of the year and one of the best movies of the year as well, so it did its job. This is going to irk some people a little bit. Some people are looking at this going, look, it looks a bit garish, I'm not a big fan of it. Personally, I really like it. It's It does that 80s theme quite well. You know, the boards and everything has that same colour scheme throughout. You've got pink dinosaur meeples to represent the ones in your park. And I've played this with some girl mates who just go ape for having pink meeples in their park. You know, it's like, it's a cute dinosaur. You know, they just love it. And if they're getting into it for that, then good on them. But it's cute to watch. So the whole colour scheme thing, not for everybody. Personally, I quite like it though. I think it fits the theme. But even if you don't like the artwork, you gotta love the production quality. Whoa, there's a lot in this game. You have got thick tiles for all the attractions, the recipes, the, uh, the different the upgrades to your sh tool rooms and that, the lab upgrades. Us, oh, there's tiles all over the place. You know, even upgraded paddocks and stuff like that. You know, all all represented by thick cardboard tiles. You know, that's why the box is quite heavy. You've got the pink dinosaur meeples, which are not small. I mean, they're fairly large-ish. And bear in mind, this is a retail version. You know, this is a retail copy, not a Kickstarter one. So you're getting all this in the box. You've got these amazing dice, which are just gorgeous to look at and nice and custom. Generally, the production quality for this game is solid and high. You could pimp it up a little bit. I mean, instead of using the, you know, I think the cardboard money they've got in there, you could always get metal coins and things like that, which to be fair, you can do with most games. But for a retail edition of this, it's a solid production. So much so that I don't particularly care about seeking out the Kickstarter version. In fact, from what I've heard, there's a couple of problems with the Kickstarter version because some people have said, oh, it'd be cool to have a different meeple for each of the different dinosaurs. Excuse me, there's like 30 recipes in this game or something around that number. Do you want 30 different meeples? Do you know how much that would cost? And as, as far as I'm aware, the Kickstarter version had five different meeples or something like that. And that means you've got some differentiation, but not enough differentiation. So where do you draw the line? You've either got to have just one or all of them. You can't have it in between. It just doesn't really work. But, you know, that's another topic. As you play through the game, there's nothing that would stand out as, wow, this is completely innovative. You know, we've never seen this mechanic before but everything feels quite streamlined. It wasn't difficult to explain the rules. Nothing felt particularly fiddly. And if you've got any knowledge of Jurassic Park, you understand the whole concept of get the DNA, make the dinosaur, put them in your park. Oh yeah, they get out, they eat people, security. You know, you've already got that in your head. So everything in this game is pretty intuitive to learn. And the phases are all laid out in sequential order. You have a different board, it says phase one, and you do everything on that board until everyone's done their appropriate number of actions. Then you move on to the other board for phase two. It's laid out in a nice logical fashion. And people might think, well, hang on, that's a lot of work placement you gotta do. How long does this game drag on for? Surprisingly, not a lot at all. The box says 90 to 120 minutes. That's pretty accurate for most games. Two player games should not set you back more than say 60 to 90 minutes. I'd say 90 is a good bet though because you'll be thinking, you'll be explaining rules, you know. So 90 minutes is a good bet. Two hours should get you a decent three player game easily. Possibly even a four player game if you know what you're doing. 
The maximum this game should take you is about two and a half hours, I think, with four players, maximum length, and that's including the rules teaching and probably an AP player. And I have played this with AP players, and yes, it can drag on a bit when you're waiting for them to take their turn. But in these cases, I found that a little bit more extreme because these are people I know who are like very AP in games. So I think just generally taking time to think won't elongate this game. This was like an extreme example. But even then, we're talking two and a half hours. Not bad at all. And this is for a medium length game. You can have short, medium or long objectives depending on your preference. Now long is perfectly fine. If you feel that the game is too short for whatever bizarre reason, then you can go for long objectives. It probably will take you a good two and a half to three hours at that point, unless you know what you're doing and can instinctively go through the turns. Medium, I think, is a decent length. You can get enough stuff in your park to have a good go at it, it lasts long enough to make it a fulfilling game and doesn't drag out too long. So medium's my favorite way to play it, but I will happily still play long. Short is a bit too short. I don't recommend doing that even for your first teaching game because short kind of ends after about an hour, maybe an hour and a quarter. And by that point, you've barely got anything in your park. It doesn't feel like you've done much. And maybe if you want to teach the rules, fine, but I think you could teach this game fine if you just played the medium length game. Short, just a little bit too short, so I don't think I'll ever play that version again. But I like the fact the game gave you the free options. And I think more games should do this, you know, give you options as to how long you want your game to be. Because most of them are generally fixed. And of course, that either means they're too short, just right, or too long, but no other choice. The other thing to note is that the worker placement phases only give you so many actions to do stuff with and everyone has an equal number of them. Scientist phase, you have three scientists. The uh, like choosing stuff from the park and the market, you've got two actions for that. So you're talking five, that's not a lot. And then when you get to the worker placement phase, phase three, where you're putting them on your player board to do various stuff, that's all simultaneous. So you don't have to wait for someone else to you know, you know, do something before you get a chance to even start. You can be working on it while someone else is doing their bit, and then occasionally one person might slow it up a little bit, but for the most part, you'll get through that phase pretty quickly. Moving straight on to the park phase, where all you've got to do is just draw some guys out, work out how much you're going to score, there you are, job done, call out the scores, one pair of tracks them down, and it's relatively quick. So the downtime is actually fairly short, for the most part, you know, suffice to AP players, of course, but for the most part, it's short for a game that's about two hours long. That's a perfect thing in my book. So many of these long games that sometimes I give a bit of jip about is the fact that they're like three to four hours long and you feel like it's three to four hours because it's like, take your turn. Here, I didn't get that. Time passed, was it two and a half hours? I think my first game was, and aside from the AP player, time just flew past when we were doing other bits. And then in subsequent games, as people learned the rules better, or I taught it to more sort of like hardcore gamers and that, we got through this game pretty like fast in terms of the time. But a bit like how Scythe, you feel like you've played an epic game in a short space of time, this one's about the same. You feel like you've done a lot in this game, and yet only a couple of hours have passed. It doesn't need to stretch out too long. Now, a lot of your enjoyment will probably come from the theme rather than the mechanics. I like all the mechanics in this game. Worker placement, you know, task selection, building up a park, you know, get victory points. Yeah, okay, that's all well and good. One of my main enjoyments, though, is the fact that this theme is just solid. I mean, if you've got any knowledge of Jurassic Park or dinosaurs, you will get half of this game's rules, as I mentioned before, but you'll just get sucked into that theme. I mean, building a theme park is already a fun theme. I mean, who did, theme park and all that stuff, Roller Coaster Tycoon, I used to love those games. Building up an amusement park, having people come round, pay me money and enjoy themselves. There was just something about that creativity that I like. And in this, it's no exception. Building up your park feels satisfac satisfactory. Yeah, it feels great. You get that sense of satisfaction, that's what I meant to say, in how you've done everything. So when you finish the game, it's a bit like how I like things like Caverna and Fields of Oh, You look at what's in front of you and you go, yes, I built that, it's my park, and it's different from the other players. Oh yeah, everybody's got dinosaurs, you can't have a park with no dinosaurs, it just won't work. But somebody might have gone full, like, omnivores, sorry, omnivores, herbivores, get it right, Luke. You know, where all they just eat plants and they're not particularly uh, exciting, but they've got lots of them cheap. So they could have a lot of them in the park. 
Whereas I might have gone, well, I haven't got many dinosaurs in my park, but I've got some exciting roller coasters, an ice cream store, and the main event, the T-Rex. Come on, who doesn't want to come to my park just to see the T-Rex? And to be fair, if I, I would love to put in a house rule that says, if you buy the Velociraptor recipe before I do, you lose the game. I love Velociraptors. How dare you buy my Velociraptors? I want them in my park. And you can just get into this game. It's solid. Everyone I've played with has got sucked into the theme. They're making Jurassic Park references. They're making all sorts of dinosaur jokes from memes and internet stuff that they've seen. Or they're just joking with each other about the ramifications of how one player's turn about three people got eaten. And it's like, scandal at park. Quickly forgiven. Next year. Hi. It's like, <laughs> stuff like that. You just get into a lot of good jokes and banter with everyone because the theme is that solid. You might be able to paste something on, but this whole getting the DNA to make the dinosaurs and then having them in your park and possibly eating people, that, everything just gels with it. It just works. And some of that may be because of a slight bias towards loving dinosaurs. But to be honest, I think if you put a different theme on here, it would still work as a game. The mechanics are still solid. Different phases with different aspects of worker placement and uh, tile selection and the whole concept of building up a park in front of you. You know, Caverner is essentially that. You know, worker placement, get tiles, build up your village and cave. I still love that one. I'm not exactly a massive like prehistoric village fan, am I? But with this one, it just sort of works. High quality production. The you know, player count, it scales fine from two to four. I will play this at any player count because you can adjust the short, medium, and long objectives. I might usually say, right, if we're doing four players, we'll do medium, three players, medium or long, and two players, long always. You know, And then I've got my perfect setup. And if you don't want to play it with uh, other players, you've even got a solo mode. You can play this alone in a special type of way where you still have to build up your park and you still have the worker placement aspects but you then have this objective tracker system where you need to complete as many objectives as you can by the end of the game, obviously get the most points, but if you can do an objective every turn, then you get like the most points. You want to try and avoid discarding objectives because you ran out of time. It's a simple tweak to a game. If you know how to play the solo game, you already know how to play half the main game and vice versa, and it works. It's a solid solo mode. I hope to maybe go through it as a playthrough when I eventually get round to experimenting with the whole solo playthrough idea I want to do. So, you know, it's definitely on the cards. And if that wasn't enough variety from you, then you've got the plot twists. These are cards that you draw for the start of a game and they change up the game in so many ways. You know, you can have, you know, free upgrades around, you can have room for extra personnel, you can have hooligans delayed until, like, during the game. They do all sorts of things and it makes each game feel different because it just changes up a key rule in the game and gives you more restriction or gives you more flexibility depending on what it is. The objectives, again, they are essentially the same between short, medium and long, which is a minor nitpick, but you know, like if it says get six dinosaurs in short game, it says eight and then 10 for the future ones. You know, it would have been nice if there was a bit more of a differentiation, but that's a minor thing. But the objectives are different and you won't use them all every game. So again, this makes you play differently depending on what comes out. It's difficult for me to come up with faults about this game. I've really enjoyed my time with it and I can't wait to get it to the table again. If I am going to mention anything that's minor flaws with it, one, it's an expensive game. Not cheap. I mean, I bought this for, what was it about? Because I didn't get this as a review copy. This is my own copy. I decided I wanted to just go grab it. I wanted it. I think I paid £65 for it in a convention. And that's a lot of money. You know, I had to sell other games in order to make room for it. But it's got a lot of quality for that price. And certainly I've been getting plenty of game for that price. You know, I'll pay the cast if I think it's going to be that good for a game. But I understand that that can be quite expensive for some people. So maybe I recommend a try before you buy approach rather than just going, it's dinosaurs, I'm going to love it, buy it. You know, oh, I did that. And that probably wasn't the smartest move. Luckily, it came up trumps for me. But for you, it might be different. On the other minor negative side is that something has to pay the price, other than your wallet, for actually getting this game to the table. And it's your table that's paying the price. This is a table hog, and then some. You've got the different boards for the phases, you've got your own boards, you've got the park board, your like lab board or whatever, you've got the like scientist worker placement board, you've got this board, you've got that board, you've got the tiles that have got to go out, you've got the other components. Whew. You're going to need a large table. Do not play this in a pub. Do not play this with small tables. You need 
a solid, I'm not talking like giant geekism table, although to be fair that helps, but certainly you're gonna need a good sized kitchen table or something to play this game on. Otherwise you're gonna be a little bit cramped and you're definitely gonna to have to be organized. It's a minor nitpick. To be fair, a lot of games these days are pretty like big on the table hog, but I thought I would just mention that. So that's all I can really say about Dinosaur Island. This is one of my favorites from 2017. It didn't appear in my top 10 of 2017 because I've only just had a chance to grab and play it. But I guarantee you, when I come round to doing the retrospective top 10 of 2017, there is a strong, highly strong chance that this is gonna make that retrospective top 10 of 17, possibly even the top five, maybe up the top three. Who knows, I am really loving this game and I am so annoyed that I didn't get to play it sooner in 2017 and as much as I don't care about seeking out the Kickstarter version, I wish I had kickstarted it when it first appeared. I got a little bit too uh, scared to do it, and plus I'd spend a bit of money on other stuff. So for me, personal rating, I'm giving this the full 10. I, I love this. This It has some minor issues with table space, and you know the theme and artwork might not be for everybody, but I'm just loving it. It's just a solid blend of streamlined mechanics, a good solid depth, lots of thinking, you know, simultaneous play so it doesn't drag out too long, minus the extreme AP players, and it just, variable gameplay, solid production, I'm just loving it. It's a fantastic game, and definitely one I think you need to try. You should certainly try it before you buy because of the cost, but otherwise, love it. Fantastic. Pandasaurus Games is really on the roll right now, and with stuff like this, they're on the way up, I can see it now. So, that's it for me. I'm gonna get on with more videos, but for now, that's it. Take care, and I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple review. But remember, even if a few patrons get eaten along the way, it's still only a game. Take care, see you next time.